Welcome to this third video in a series of programs about the Citroen Hydropneumatic System. If you haven't already viewed the previous two tapes, then we advise that you do so before watching this one. Like the previous videos, this program concentrates mainly upon the basic system as fitted to the Citroen Xantia. However, this time we'll look in more detail at the operation of some of the components. To help you absorb the information, we've split this program into four sections. The first of which describes the principles behind the source and reserve of pressure. Section 2 builds upon these principles with particular regard to the suspension system. In section 3, we'll look at the braking system. And in section 4, we'll study the power steering system. The accompanying workbook is also split into sections. It's recommended that you view each section of the video and then refer to the relevant part of the book. Before we look at the source and reserve of pressure, let's start with a few facts about the hydraulic pipes and seals. As we've seen in the previous videos, the pressurised LHM is fed to the various components through steel pipes, which have an epoxy coating. And this fluid may then be returned to the reservoir via LHM-compatible rubber or plastic pipes, either as an operational return, such as that from the power steering, or as a leakage return from components within the system. You may be surprised to know that there is approximately 50 metres of piping on some of our cars. The preformed pipes are supplied in three sizes, with outside diameters of 3.5 millimetres, 4.5 millimetres, and 6.35 millimetres. And on hydroactive vehicles, which we'll be looking at in video 4, some pipes are 10 millimetres in diameter. By the way, only ever use original parts, and for safety reasons, never repair a damaged steel pipe. The reservoir, which is not pressurised, holds approximately 4 litres of LHM fluid. Its purpose is to store, filter, de-emulsify and cool the hydraulic fluid. If you recall, program 2 showed you how to clean the filters and change the fluid. LHM from the reservoir passes to the 6 plus 2 pump. We studied the pump in the first video, and if you remember, it's split into two sections that share a common feed from the reservoir. One section has six pistons, or pumping elements, to supply the power steering, and on most vehicles it includes a pressure regulator. The other section has only two pistons, no pressure regulator, and supplies the source and reserve of pressure circuit. From the pump, the LHM passes either to the power-assisted steering system, which we'll look at later, or to the main accumulator and pressure regulator assembly. To aid explanation, we've made a graphic of the pressure regulator, so that you can see what's happening inside. Essentially, the regulator consists of four chambers which are interconnected by various drillings. A non-return valve and two slide valves, each of which are attached to springs. The larger valve we'll call the main valve, whilst the smaller one we'll refer to as the pilot valve. 
Chamber A is connected to the supply. Chamber U connects to the accumulator and the user circuit, and also to Chamber A via the non-return valve. Chamber R is constantly joined to the reservoir. And finally, there is Chamber B. It's connected to A or R, depending upon the position of the pilot valve. With the engine running, LHM from the pump lifts the non-return valve and increases the pressure in chamber U, the accumulator and the user circuit. Due to the position of the pilot valve, the pressure increases by the same amount in B. And this pressure, combined with the spring pressure, ensures the main valve is held up. The increasing line pressure in chamber U causes an increasing force on the upper face of the pilot valve, which tends to push it down against its spring. Incidentally, the fluid pressure above and below the main valve is equal. It's held in its uppermost position by its spring. When the force above the pilot valve becomes slightly greater than its spring force, it starts to move down thus closing the high-pressure inlet to B. As the line pressure in chamber U continues to increase, the pilot valve is pushed further. This action causes B to be connected with the reservoir through R. As the pressure in chamber B falls to zero, the main valve, subjected to the pressure in chamber U, is pushed down against its spring. In reality, both the valves move at the same time, resulting in the familiar click associated with cutout. As a result, the pump is connected with the reservoir via R. At the same time, the pressure in chamber U closes the non-return valve causing the LHM to flow to the reservoir, unpressurized. If you recall, when this occurs, the pump is said to be idling or freewheeling, and the hydraulic system is fully charged. As components within the system consume fluid, the pressure in chamber U decreases. In turn, the pilot valve moves up under the action of its spring. It initially closes the return orifice to R and then connects chambers A and B together. As the fluid consumption increases, the pressure in chamber U drops further. As soon as the force created by the pressure in chamber U becomes lower than the force of the main valve spring, the valve moves and closes the return line to the reservoir. There's no noticeable click when this happens, but you may be able to hear the pump start to work again as it delivers pressurized LHM into chamber U and the whole cycle begins again. So let's now move on and look at the next component in the system, the safety valve. It gives priority to the front brake circuit in the event of a large loss of pressure and at the same time isolates the two braking circuits from each other. Pressurized LHM enters the safety valve here and passes to the front brakes. The remaining ports are to the front suspension, the rear suspension and the reservoir, which is in fact a leakage return. The valve is attached to a calibrated spring and one end rests against the plunger of the mechanical warning light switch. When the pressure in the circuit is below 80 bar, the only route available for the LHM is to the front brakes, and provided that the ignition is on, the stop lamp is illuminated. Once the pressure has reached somewhere in the region of 80 to 100 bar, two things happen. 
Firstly, the valve overcomes the spring pressure and moves, allowing fluid to flow to both the front and rear suspension circuits. And secondly, the stop lamp is extinguished. If the pressure falls for any reason to below that of the spring, the valve moves back and fluid can no longer flow to the suspension. In addition, the switch contacts close and the warning lamp lights. As you already know, don't drive the car if this lamp is illuminated. The previous videos showed that the steel spheres contained a flexible synthetic diaphragm, on one side of which is nitrogen gas, and on the other is LHM fluid. Unlike an accumulator, each of the four suspension spheres include a damper. It's worth noting that there are a variety of suspension spheres for each model. The size of the damper's drilling and the bump and rebound characteristics can all vary with the vehicle's specification. Furthermore, the volume of the sphere, the diaphragm material and the gas pressure can also differ. The technician's handbook lists over several pages the variations for both Citroen Xantia and Citroen XM. So make sure you order the correct part. It's not simply a case that all Citroën Xantias have identical front suspension spheres. The suspension cylinders differ front and rear, but work on similar principles. The steel front units are non-serviceable, whereas seals and gaiters are available to repair the alloy rear cylinders. Essentially, the units are a cylinder and piston assembly. One component is connected to the vehicle's body and the other is connected to the suspension arm. As the body and suspension move, the two parts slide in relation to each other and LHM fluid passes between the sphere and the cylinder. The front unit has an integral bump stop whilst the rear suspension has a separate bump stop fitted between the arm and the body. In addition to the leakage return, the rear units also have a separate breather pipe connected to the gator. If fluid is leaking from here, there are two things to consider. Firstly, the seals in that particular cylinder may need replacing. Or secondly, the leak may have been caused by a blocked leakage return pipe. The previous programs explained the height correctors function and how to adjust them. You also know that they include a time delay to ensure they only react to a definite change in the vehicle's load. Let's now see how it works. The light alloy body contains a press-fitted steel sleeve. Within the sleeve slides the familiar height corrector valve that controls the quantity of LHM in each pair of suspension cylinders. In this example, we'll just show the front height corrector, although the rear one works in exactly the same way. At either end of the valve body are two chambers that contain unpressurized LHM. Two channels allow the fluid to move from one chamber to the other. One channel utilizes a series of calibrated washers to form a dash pot. The other is a simple drilling within the steel sleeve. When the car is loaded, the valve moves slowly from the mid position as the fluid is forced via the dash pot from the right-hand chamber to the left. Once the ride height is correct, the valve is able to rapidly return to the mid position as the fluid passes through the bypass drilling, lifting the valve plate as it flows. 
Once the valve has settled in its mid position, the spring forces the valve plate shut. When the load is removed, the reverse occurs. One word of warning. If a faulty height corrector is suspected during diagnosis, please don't leap to the conclusion that it is always the unit which is at fault. Be sure to check that the return lines are clear and that the linkages are connected, adjusted and moving freely. Anti-sinking valves, like the height correctors, are part of the suspension system. As the name suggests, their purpose is to prevent the vehicle sinking when it stood for a long time. By the way, the workshop manuals refer to the anti-sinking system as SCMAC. Without anti-sinking valves, the front suspension's residual pressure would gradually be lost through the height corrector. Similarly, the rear pressure would be lost through the rear height corrector and also the brake control valve. With the engine running and the safety valve open, pressurised LHM forces the anti-sinking valve against its spring. This action opens the anti-sinking valve, allowing fluid to pass to the height corrector and in turn, upon demand, to the suspension. Fluid can also flow in the reverse direction from the suspension, through the anti-sinking valve and height corrector, and back to the reservoir. When the engine is stopped, the residual line pressure from the safety valve diminishes. In turn, the suspension pressure plus the spring pressure gradually become dominant and close the anti-sinking valves. Thus, the fluid is trapped between the anti-sinking valve and the suspension, which maintains the car's height. However, if the line pressure dropped whilst driving and the anti-sinking valves closed, no fluid pressure from the rear suspension would be available for the rear brakes. To avoid this, an additional sphere is fitted. It acts as a rear brake accumulator to supply the brake control valve in such an event. And please remember, before carrying out any repairs, always fully depressurize the system. The procedure was explained in the previous video and is covered in the workshop manual. It's recommended that the engine must run for at least one minute with the manual control set to the low position. As you can now see, the reason for this is that only under these conditions will the anti-sinking valves remain open to ensure that all the LHM returns to the reservoir, thus making the suspension system fully depressurized and therefore safe to work upon. Fully depressurizing the system is also particularly important when working upon a vehicle fitted with the hydractive suspension. In this section, we'll look at the brake control valve. If you remember, the front and rear circuits are independent. The front receives fluid from the safety valve. And the rear brake circuit is supplied from the rear suspension via the rear brake accumulator. Three valves lie within the assembly. The first two are in the main part of the brake control valve. And the third valve is incorporated in the brake pressure compensator that automatically adjusts the braking effort to the rear wheels. For simplicity, we'll ignore the compensator for now and come back to it later. 
The front valve is mechanically operated by the brake pedal and is connected to the front brakes. The second valve in the circuit is between the rear brake accumulator and the rear brakes. It's operated by front brake pressure or mechanically in the event of a failure in the source and reserve of pressure. With no force on the brake pedal, the supply ports from the safety valve and from the rear accumulator are closed. Note that in this position, both the front and rear brake calipers are connected to the reservoir via this drilling and the return pipe, hence there's no line pressure to the brakes. Any force applied to the brake pedal is felt directly by the front brake valve. It moves, closing the return port, and allows fluid from the safety valve to progressively flow to the front brakes, and also, through its centre drilling, to the space between itself and the rear brake valve. At the same time, this hydraulic pressure acts upon the rear brake valve, causing it to move against its spring. Fluid can then flow from the rear brake accumulator to the rear brakes. In much the same way as the front valve, fluid also flows through its centre drilling to the space behind the valve. The pressure behind the valve, added to the spring pressure, balances the force acting on its other end. This action causes the valve to stop moving and the pressure in the rear brake circuit to stabilise. Don't forget, though, that the pressure behind the rear valve also acts towards the pedal. This pressure, added to the pressure between the two valves, provides a resistance, or feel. If the pedal effort isn't altered, the front brake pressure stabilises and both valves remain in equilibrium. Thus, a relationship has been established between the force upon the brake pedal and the pressure delivered to the front and rear brake calipers. When the pedal is released, the valves move back to their starting positions under the action of the brake supply pressure and fluid from the brake calipers can once again return to the reservoir. It's worth noting that although the pressures to the front and rear brakes may be different, they rise at the same rate and continue to do so until the compensator begins to have an effect. Let's now consider how the compensator works. Its sole function is to modulate the pressure in the rear brakes and so regulate the braking effort according to the load carried by the rear wheels. With the brakes off, a drilling allows fluid from the rear suspension via the brake accumulator to act upon one end of a shuttle valve assembly, pushing it fully against its spring. Note that now we've added the compensator, the connection to the rear brakes is made via the chamber behind the shuttle valve. When light brake pressure is applied, the rear brake valve moves left, allowing fluid to the rear brakes, and at the same time lets some fluid pass through its internal drilling. The fluid between the shuttle valve and rear brake valve provides an opposing force upon the rear brake valve, thus helping to generate the feel on the brake pedal. Note that the shuttle valve assembly remains fully left and stays in this position until compensation commences. Increasing the brake pedal effort causes a progressive increase in fluid pressure passing to the rear brakes. The pressure in the rear chamber is now sufficient, with assistance from the spring, to overcome the rear suspension pressure felt at the other end of the shuttle valve. The shuttle valve moves right and it contacts the rear brake valve and thereafter they operate as one. This is the start of the compensation phase. Now, to raise the rear brake pressure, the pedal effort must rise sufficiently to overcome the shuttle valve spring and the hydraulic pressure felt over the entire surface area of the shuttle valve. 
There is some reduction in the force required due to the effect of the suspension pressure exerted on the annular ring of the shuttle valve. Hence, to increase the rear brake pressure, the front pressure must rise proportionally much higher than before. Moreover, the rear brake pressure rises at a slower rate than that of the front, which reduces the tendency for the rear wheels to lock. And remember, the rear suspension supplies the rear brake circuit. So, irrespective of how much extra effort is exerted on the brake pedal, the maximum rear brake pressure is limited to the pressure in the rear suspension. Power-assisted steering reduces the effort required by the driver. The amount of assistance is automatically varied depending upon the resistance from the steered wheels. During parking, when the steering would be difficult to turn, the system provides maximum assistance. But when travelling at speed, or on ice, the assistance is limited to optimise directional stability. To provide the assistance, the steering rack incorporates a hydraulic ram. One end is connected to the rack casing, whilst the other is connected to the rack itself. LHM fluid is supplied to the pinion control valve and is directed to either side or both sides of the ram's piston. Fluid can return to the reservoir through a separate pipe. It's the pinion control valve's job to apportion the pressure. So let's see how it works. The valve is fitted with a torsion bar. One end is secured in the pinion and the other end is held in the rotor, which is directly connected to the steering column. The torsion bar determines the level of power resistance in proportion to the resistance of the tyres on the ground. When the steering wheel is turned, the bar twists, resulting in an offset between the rotor and the pinion. At low speed, the resistance is high, and in turn, the larger offset allows more assistance. But at higher speeds, or when driving over a slippery surface, the resistance is comparatively low, resulting in less offset and in turn, less assistance. For safety reasons, in the unlikely event of a hydraulic failure, the steering is not lost because the end of the rotor fits inside the pinion. This arrangement allows approximately seven degrees of movement in either direction before the rotor makes contact with the pinion to give the mechanical link to the steering. Let's now look at how a right-hand drive pinion control valve and hydraulic ram work together. The principle is the same for left-hand drive, but the components are arranged differently. The valve body contains the pinion valve, and within it is the rotor. The center chamber of the rotor is permanently connected to the reservoir, whilst the hydraulic ram is connected to the valve body via two pipes. With the steering wheel at rest, the rotor sits in a neutral position. This allows LHM from the pump to flow into the valve body and to both sides of the piston. As the rotor is permanently connected to the reservoir, the fluid is able to flow back to it unrestricted. Hence no pressure builds within the system and there's no assistance. If the steering wheel is turned to the left, the right-hand side of the piston remains connected to the reservoir. And at the same time, fluid from the pump can enter the left-hand side of the ram and the pressure rises. 
the pressure forces the piston towards the right and in doing so pulls the steering rack with it, turning the wheels to the left. When the driver wants to turn right, the rotor moves in the opposite direction. In this case, the return line to the reservoir closes and pressure builds on either side of the piston. The surface area to the right of the piston is twice that to the left. Therefore, the resulting force on the right-hand side is twice that on the left, and so the piston moves left, assisting the steering to turn the wheels to the right. There are two further points to note. Firstly, as we mentioned earlier, the assistance is variable. If the offset between the rotor and pinion is not at its maximum, the flow rate is reduced. In turn, the piston moves more sensitively as there is less resulting force upon it. And secondly, the pressure in the system is limited by a pressure regulating valve. If you remember, it's either fitted inside the 6 plus 2 pump or on some models it may be fitted remotely. Well, that's covered the details of the main components. You can now complete the final section of the workbook. If you feel you need to study any of the sections again, then please rewind the tape as many times as necessary. Once completed, send your answer sheet to the training department at Slough for marking. You should now have a good working knowledge of the basic principles, how to maintain the system, and how the major components operate. We hope that at this stage you now feel more confident about fault finding and that you'll always try to apply the knowledge you've gained from the three videos. And if you'd like to discover how the hydraulic system has evolved, then please watch the fourth programme where we'll be looking at the hydractive suspension and the active roll control system. But until then, thank you for watching.